welcome to my channel. My name is Erica and today's video is episode six of a true crime series I'm doing here on my channel, True Crime in Oregon. Now I've always been very intrigued by true crime and I am from the state of Oregon so I thought it would be interesting to combine those two things. Now I upload these videos once a month and I decided that I'm going to finish out the year of 2023 focusing on true crime cases from Oregon but starting next year and beyond I'm going to be focusing on crime cases from all over the place. So Maybe that might be more interesting to some of you, uh, but I don't know, I just thought I would start off with Oregon and then build from there. Now this video is the case of Dayton Leroy Rogers, also known as the Malala Forest Killer, and he brutally murdered eight sex workers in the Portland, Oregon area, uh, primarily in the Malala Forest, which is a beautiful foresty area not far away from the city proper of Portland in 1987. And I will also be detailing a lot of other crimes that Dayton Rogers committed throughout his life. And all of the information that I'm giving you in today's video came from this book right here. And this is called Bloodlust Portrait of a Serial Sex Killer by Gary C. King. And Gary did an amazing job of compiling all of the information uh, that's in this book that I'm going to be giving you in today's video about Dayton's life, uh, his crimes, the victims, the investigation. And I'm going to be giving you guys a lot of detail in this video, but I can't give it all to you or this video would be hours long. So if you are interested in learning more about this case, I highly recommend checking this book out. Uh, I did get this off Amazon and I'll have the link, the Amazon link to this book in my description box. So if you're interested in picking this up, you can do that. Now, as with all of my other true crime videos, I want to give a huge disclaimer. Viewer discretion is absolutely advised. I'm going to be detailing some very violent sexual crimes and that obviously is, is not easy to listen to. It's, it's not easy for me to do these videos. But I really do recommend that you not have young viewers around while you're watching this or listening to this. So without any further ado, let's get into the case of Dayton Leroy Rogers, also known as the Malala Forest Killer. Dayton Leroy Rogers was born September 30th, 1953 in Moscow, Idaho to Ordis and Jasperell Rogers. He had two biological sisters, three adopted sisters, and one adopted brother. Now, the Rogers family was extremely religious, and they were all devout members of the Seventh-day Adventist faith and were seen by local community members as religious zealots. Dayton and his siblings lived in a very traditional household. Uh, they attended church regularly, and they also had uh, regular Bible study family time in the evenings. Uh, Jasperell was a stay-at-home housewife and mother, and by all accounts really adored her children. Now, Ortis was the absolute patriarch of the family. He made all of the familial decisions and he ruled the household with an iron fist. Ortis was a semi-skilled baker, house painter, and would frequently teach at Seventh-day Adventist-run schools. Uh, but he was frequently out of work, and so he was constantly moving the family around in search of employment. Now, Jasperell, she was convinced that Armageddon was always looming in the near future. So anytime the Rogers family would move, she would want them to settle in small towns, kind of rural farm-like communities away from larger cities. Both she and Ortis felt that large cities were just havens of lust and sin, and they really wanted to do their best to keep their children away from that kind of an environment. Now, Ortis, he was a staunch supporter of the adage, spare the rod, spoil the child. And he felt that because he was the patriarch of the family, uh, the breadwinner of the family, the, the person that provided the roof over everyone's head, that he had the right to discipline and punish his children in any way that he saw fit. And frequently Dayton and his siblings were beaten horribly by their father. And it was not uncommon for them to show up at church bloodied, bruised, and battered. Ortis also believed that his children were possessed by an evil entity and that the only way he could rid them of this evil entity was to beat it out of them. And also to continually indoctrinate his children with the church's teachings. Anything that had to do with sex or sexual activity, uh, any kind of discussion of that was strictly forbidden in the Rogers household. And if the children made any kind of sexual comment, no matter how innocuous it was, they would get beaten within an inch of their life. Ortis also monitored everything that his children came into contact with, what they listened to, what they watched on TV, what they were reading. 
And anything that even remotely resembled anything having to do with sex or sexual activity, he took it away from them. For instance, they did have family albums that had Hawaiian music. And on the front of the uh, album covers, there were women that were wearing like hula skirts. And he would take a black marker and mark out their entire bodies because he felt that that was just very lewd and lascivious uh, advertisement. Ortis also had no respect for women outside of his religion. Uh, he was frequently known to call women sluts and whores. And he would commonly say that any woman that had sex outside of marriage should be taken out into the streets and stoned to death. Now, because Ortis was frequently out of work, uh, the Rogers family lived a very meager, poor existence and would typically live in very small homes. And at one point, uh, he actually moved the whole family into an abandoned chicken coop with a dirt floor and then attempted to uh, make that over into the family home. And because they were living in such small quarters, uh, Dayton and the rest of his siblings were made to sleep in the same bedroom. And as time went on and the children grew and matured, that posed a very significant problem. As Dayton grew into adolescence, he started having very violent sexual fantasies. And these violent sexual fantasies usually would involve his sisters because those were the females that he had the most contact with. There was a lot of social isolation going on. And so really his sisters were the only females that he had exposure to. Not only that, but he developed a very significant foot fetish. And his sisters started noticing that their shoes would go missing. And they ended up finding out that Dayton was stealing their shoes to masturbate with as he was having these very violent sexual fantasies about their feet. And when Ortis found out about that, he beat Dayton severely and repeatedly. Now, when Dayton was in the seventh grade, that's when he had his first run in with law enforcement. At this point, the Rogers family was living in Walla Walla, Washington. And Dayton and a really good buddy of his took their BB guns and went out into the street and started shooting at cars. And of course were caught and this, this was dealt with. And how Ortis dealt with this, of course, was to beat Dayton. And then he put him in a very strict private religious school called the Upper Columbia Academy in Spangle, Washington. However, that arrangement didn't last very long because of course Ortis lost his job. And so he moved the family to Pleasant Hill, Oregon to take a job as a cabinet maker. And at that point he enrolled Dayton into to the uh, Emerald Junior Academy, which is another very strict religious private school. Now at this point was when Dayton started to just absolutely despise and hate his father and also despise and hate his mother. He really felt like his mother never did a good job of trying to like intervene and stop his father from beating himself and his siblings. So at around age 16 was when Dayton decided that he was going to completely reject the way he was raised, his religion, uh, his family, the social isolation. He had just had enough of this. So he dropped out of high school uh, in the middle of his sophomore year and moved to Corvallis, Oregon by himself and took a job as a house painter. In July of 1972, at age 19, Dayton left Corvallis, Oregon and moved to Eugene, Oregon to take a union house painting job. And at that point, he met 16-year-old Julie. And they were dating for not very long and got married right away. Now, this was when Dayton was labeled as the black sheep of his family uh, by his parents because uh, they were freaked out that he'd married a Lutheran. Uh, not the fact that sh he was 19 and she was 16 and they hardly knew each other, but because she was a Lutheran, they just had absolutely no use for Dayton anymore and basically just kind of cut ties with him. Now, 30 days after Dayton and Julie were married, that's when his criminal history really got started in terms of his violent propensity towards women. In August of 1972, Dayton raced a 15-year-old girl into the Sacred Heart Hospital emergency room in Eugene, Oregon, and she had a knife sticking out of her abdomen. Now, initially, the story was that she and Dayton had met each other the day before, uh, had been attracted to each other, had gone out into the woods and had sex. Uh, and then they made arrangements to see each other the following day. So on this day in particular that I'm talking about right now, uh, he's driving over to pick up this 15 year old girl and just happens to see her walking down the street with a knife sticking out of her abdomen uh, that she'd done this to herself. So of course he races her to the hospital and uh, you know, the hospital staff was kind of like, what in the world is going on here? So of course uh, they, they talk with Dayton, they talk with this 15 year old, uh, they get her into a room and start treating her, of course. So she was there for a couple of days. And the longer she was there and the more she was away from Dayton, she started saying what really had happened here. Now, part of the story was true. They did meet each other the day before. They had gone out into the woods and had had sex. 
Uh, they decided they wanted to see each other the next day. Uh, so he had gone and picked her up and taken her back out into the woods. And as they were kind of rolling around on the ground, laughing, kissing and tickling, the next thing she knows, Dayton has stabbed her in the stomach. Now, initially, when she like asked him, what, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? He told her that he could no longer trust her and that he had to punish her. And then uh, kind of almost like to smooth things over, he starts telling her how much he loves her and that he really wants to get married to her, even though he's already married. I mean, she was just in an absolute state of panic. And she did luckily convince him to take her to the hospital, but he said, you are going to lie. You're gonna go along with the story that I'm gonna create, make up here, because if, if you don't, I'm gonna get in a lot of trouble. But uh, fortunately, she did tell the truth and Dayton was uh, apprehended, arrested, and taken down to the Lane County Jail in Eugene, Oregon. Now, upon his uh, entrance into the Lane County Jail was the first time that Dayton had any kind of like psychological assessment done. Uh, the Lane County Jail psychologist met with Dayton on a few occasions and performed a series of psychological tests on him or with him. And it was determined that he had a very depressive neuroses and that he also had a possible long-standing schizoid personality disorder. But the psychologist also said that Dayton knew very well the difference between right and wrong, and that he was in full control of all of his faculties during this crime. Now, after several months, the case did go to court in February of 1973. And Dayton, fearing very serious jail time, plea bargained the, the charge down to second degree assault. He received no jail time and four years probation. Not quite six months after that crime was committed, Dayton was again in trouble with law enforcement. He and his young bride are living together in Eugene, Oregon, and they allowed two teenage girl runaways to stay with them for a while. Now, at this point in Dayton's life, he is drinking very heavily, like basically a full-blown alcoholic. And he would get really drunk and come on to these teenage girls. He would try to encourage them to engage in sexual activity with him. And so Julie had finally just had enough and she left the house for a while. And one evening, Dayton, in a drunken rage, attacked both of these teenage runaways with a beer bottle and beat them severely. I mean, really injured both of them. And fortunately, they were able to escape the home, uh, go, I think, next door, call the police. And even though Dayton did flee the scene, uh, police were able to apprehend him and harass him yet again. So Dayton is once again being housed at the Lane County Jail, and another series of psychological assessments were done on him. And at this point, he was diagnosed as a sociopathic schizophrenic with antisocial traits. And when this case finally went to court, the prosecuting attorney made it very clear to the judge that Dayton was an extremely violent and extremely dangerous sex offender, and that he really needed to be housed either in prison or at a psychiatric facility to try to get help to stop him from committing these violent sexual crimes. So in March of 1974, he was admitted into the Oregon State Hospital in Salem, Oregon. Now, Dayton was, was not dumb. He knew exactly how to work the system. And so when he would meet with his psychiatrists and psychologists while he was being housed in the Oregon State Hospital, he would do his best to talk about his crimes, talk about how horrible they were, uh, talk about the fact that he had all these violent sexual fantasies and that he really only would gain sexual satisfaction through violence with women. Uh, he basically just stayed to the letter of the law in the hospital. He did all the things he was told to do. Uh, he, you know, did the therapy speak very well, I guess I would say. Uh, he adhered to all the do's and don'ts in the hospital. And in November of 1974, his psychologist uh, wrote in his final report that Dayton was cured, cured of what had ailed him. And in December of 1974, he was set free. So he is a free man back out on the streets again. Now, while Dayton was being treated in the hospital, Julie left him for good. Uh, she moved to California, divorced him, and never saw Dayton again. Three months after being released from the Oregon State Hospital, Dayton decided to stay in Salem, Oregon, rather than moving back to Eugene. And he met his next future wife. Her name was Sherry Miller. Uh, she was young, very naive, very sweet, very sexually inexperienced and fell madly in love with Dayton. And in October of 1975, they were married. 
Now, Sherry came from a very loving, very supportive, very nurturing family. And Dayton, of course, did not come from that type of environment. So when he and Sherry got married, he really ingrained himself into the Miller family. Uh, he spent a lot of time with Sherry's parents and other extended family members, but just really, I, I think, finally felt like he found the family that he'd always been searching for. Now, shortly after their wedding, uh, Dayton got fired from his house painting job in Salem, Oregon. And basically, he just kind of spiraled downhill. He started drinking again very heavily. He was taking amphetamines and they lost their house. So he and Sherry moved in with Sherry's parents and continued to live there for quite some time. On December 5th of 1975, uh, Dayton's criminal history picks back up again. Uh, he met an 18-year-old girl uh, outside of the Salem, Oregon fairgrounds, and it was you know, middle of the night. And he says to her, hey, do you want to go down to the bar and have some drinks with me? And she says, well, I can. I'm only 18 years old. And so he comes up with this story very quickly. He says, hey, I have an aunt and uncle that live in Woodburn, which is like a kind of a suburb town outside of Portland, about 45 minutes away from Salem. And he says, my aunt and uncle's dog just had puppies and they're selling these puppies for $50 a piece. Would you like to come with me? And you can pick out a puppy if, if you have 50 bucks. And this girl says, okay, yeah, why not? They head off to what she thinks they're, they're going to is Woodburn. Uh, but he stops at a local convenience store and picks up some travel size bottles of Smirnoff vodka and some uh, little plastic bottles of orange juice, which he proceeds to drink. And of course she joins him in drinking as well. However, rather than going to Woodburn, he takes her to a very isolated spot uh, outside of Portland, the Portland area. Uh, he forces her to get into the back seat of the car. He ties her up with electrical wire and viciously rapes her. Uh, fortunately, uh, she was able to convince him to let her get out of the car after he had raped her so that she could relieve herself. And she just makes a run for it. She takes off, uh, travels qu quite a bit. I mean, they were, like I said, in an isolated area, but just keeps running until she finally gets to a neighborhood. She goes up to this person's door, knocks, they let her in. She's able to call the police. And fortunately, uh, when Dayton was trying to, to flee, his car got stuck in the mud. So he was easily apprehended, arrested, and taken down to the Clackamas County Jail. Now, even though he was arrested and his car was searched and he was indicted uh, uh, on first degree rape charges, uh, he didn't really stay long in jail. They, they basically just gave him a trial date for May and released him. Now, two months after that crime, in February of 1976, he committed another crime. Uh, he was driving down Highway 22 and happened upon this 19-year-old girl who was walking down the road. Uh, she had just visited her boyfriend at the Oregon State Penitentiary. So he pulls over and asks her if she'd like a ride. And she says, yes, I do. I, I need to get to my uh, grandmother's house in Oregon City. So he agrees to give her a ride to Oregon City. Now, as with the last crime I just mentioned, he stops at a local convenience store, picks up some alcohol, encourages her to drink along with him, and they take off going to what she thinks is Oregon City so she can be dropped off at her grandmother's house. Now, rather than taking her to Oregon City like he said he was going to, he ends up taking her to a very isolated part of the Silver Falls State Park, which I have been to before. It's absolutely beautiful. Uh, but he takes her to a very isolated spot, uh, makes her take off all of her clothes, tells her to get in the backseat of the car, ties her up and is attempting to rape her when all of a sudden a car pulls up near them. And he completely panics, jumps back in the driver's seat and takes off and heads now to the Malala forest. Uh, he gets her into another isolated area, uh, attempts to retie her up again. And at this point she starts to fight him. She takes her shoe off and starts smashing him in the head with it. And something just kind of stopped him. I think he realized like this person is going to really fight me. And he, I think he was afraid that she was going to hurt him. So he, he stopped, gets back in the driver's seat and then does take her to Oregon city and drops her off at her grandmother's house. Now she has hardly any clothes on. She's been tied up and she is scared to death. So luckily, you know, she went right into her grandmother's house and they called the police and he was again apprehended and arrested. Now, also, I want to mention that there was another uh, criminal situation that happened with Dayton at some point, either, uh, I think it was between these two crimes that I've just detailed. Uh, he was driving through a Salem, Oregon neighborhood, and he came upon two girls. Uh, one was 15, one was 16, and they were walking to school. They had missed the bus, and one of their cars wouldn't start. 
So he convinces them to get in the car with him. Uh, they go to the convenience store to get some alcohol and they go sit at a park. Uh, and, you know, these girls are 15 and 16, very naive. I mean, they're probably just thinking, oh, wow, this, this cool guy is going to let us drink some alcohol. Uh, he ends up tying up one of the girls and rapes her viciously while the other girl is sitting right next to her witnessing this whole thing. And they were both able to escape and they did call the police and a police report was made. So Dayton was finally processed through the court system, like really processed through the court system in January of 1977, facing all the charges of these crimes that I just detailed. Now, initially he was sentenced to two five-year stretches in prison and the prosecuting attorney begged the judge, begged the judge, please do not give him parole. Do not let him out early. I mean, this guy is showing a huge violent propensity towards women. He's very sexually violent and he's unstoppable. So please make him adhere to this sentence, these two five-year sentences. And he ended up being paroled after five years. So he only served half of his sentence and was put on probation. But after a year, the probation was ended. He was no longer under any kind of supervision from law enforcement. Now, fast forward to 1987. So it's been five years since he's been released from prison. He's still married to Sherry. Uh, they now are the parents of a young son and they're living in Woodburn, Oregon, which is a kind of a suburb town just outside of Portland. And he now is the owner of his own business. He has a small engine repair business and they live just down the street from Sherry's parents. And really to all outside assumptions, everything looks very normal in the Rogers household. You know, mom, dad, little boy, close with the family. He has his own business. Everything just is hunky-dory. But that is the furthest thing from the truth. Over the past five years since Dayton was released from prison, he is now frequently soliciting sex workers. And what he would primarily do is go down to downtown Portland into certain areas and pick up these sex workers. Uh, most often would stop at the local liquor store, pick up these little small travel sized bottles of Stirnoff vodka and little bottles of orange juice and take them out into the Malala forest and do just horrible things to them. And several of these women uh, were able to escape from these attacks and they started talking to the other more inexperienced younger sex workers in the Portland downtown Portland area and telling them to stay away from this guy. Now they all knew him as Steve. Uh, that's what he would tell these women that his name was Steve and that he was from either Las Vegas or Reno. Uh, he would dress kind of like in Western attire and he would always be driving his light blue uh, Nissan pickup truck. So these women that had uh, gone with him and experienced this, these horrible situations with him were really trying to spread the word to stay away from him, that he was violent, that he would take them out into the Malala forest, he would uh, strip them, he would threaten them with a knife, he would tie them up, he would viciously bite their feet, rape them, and just do all kinds of just horrible things to them. And uh, the sex workers were starting to notice that several of their friends were going missing and they were very concerned about that. And a lot of these women that survived what he would put them through were going to the police and making reports about it. But up to this point, not a whole lot was being done about those reports. Now you might be wondering how, how is he getting away with this? Like where did his wife think he was? And typically his routine was that he would come home from work, have just a nice dinner with his family, his wife and his son, and you know, spend some time with them. And then he would say that he needed to go back down to his shop and work on work that he'd gotten behind on or that he had like a really big uh, engine that he needed to repair. And most often he would say that he had spent the night down at his shop. And Sherry was just very naive and completely in denial and just accepted his word for his word. And finally, uh, Dayton's reign of terror went completely out of control. On the evening of August 6th, 1987, started off just as a regular evening. Dayton got home from work. He had dinner with his wife and son, hung out for a little while, and then said that he needed to go back down to his shop and work on some work that he'd got fallen behind on. But instead, he gets dressed up in his Western garb, uh, stops by a local liquor store and picks up his small travel size uh, Smirnoff vodka bottles with some of the small orange juice bottles and heads into downtown Portland. And at about one o'clock in the morning on uh, August 7th, 1987, he picks up 26 year old Jenny Smith, who is a known sex worker in the area. And uh, she, she knows who he is. She's, she's been known to talk about this guy, Steve, and is very leery of him. But 
I think a lot of times the reason why these women would continue to go with him is because they wanted to make money and the lure of making money outweighed their fear of him. Instead of taking her though out to the Malala forest, he finds this large parking lot uh, in another area of downtown Portland. It's the parking lot of the GMAC building and goes kind of parks in the shadows of this parking lot. Now, I don't think he realized, but this parking lot butted up against a Denny's parking lot. And Denny's is a pretty popular diner type restaurant in the United States, and it's open 24 hours a day. So he tells Jenny to take off all of her clothes. He binds her wrists together with her own shoelaces and tells her to kneel down on the floorboards of the truck and to bend over the seat. And in the meantime, he reaches into the glove box and pulls out this very large uh, Regency Sheffield kitchen knife. And she happens to glance over her shoulder and she sees this knife and she just starts screaming and she's absolutely terrified. And in a panic, he starts to stab her in the lower back. Now, somehow she was able to get herself free of her bindings. Uh, she actually ended up like facing him where he sliced her breast. Uh, but she was able to get her hands free, open the truck door, and start making a run for it across the parking lot. But of course, he's like right on her tail, and he ends up grabbing her, tackling her down to the ground, and starts viciously stabbing her in the torso. Now, there's people that are coming out of the Denny's into the parking lot to go home, of course, and they can hear this woman screaming. And so two men look over, and they see what looks like this woman being viciously attacked by this guy. So they take off running, start hollering, telling him to leave her alone, get away from her. And he panics, Dayton panics, throws the knife in the bushes and takes off for his car, gets in his truck and takes off. Now, luckily, one of the gentlemen had the presence of mind to go get into his car and follow Dayton quite a way, caught up with him pretty well and got his license plate and wrote that down. Uh, he ended up coming back to the Denny's parking lot and assisting people in trying to save Jenny's life. 911 had been called, uh, the police show up, the paramedics show up, and they do everything in their power to try to save Jenny's life. But unfortunately, she died on her way to the hospital due to her injuries and her the massive amount of blood that she'd lost. The lead detective in this case, his name is John Turner, and he gets called to come down to the Denny's parking lot and start investigating this crime. That's primarily what he was known for, was to investigate sex crimes. Now, the really interesting part of all of this is that just the day before, the day before that Jenny Smith lost her life, uh, John Turner is looking through some reports that were laid on his desk. Now, one report is of an 18-year-old girl who was picked up by this man named Steve in a light blue Nissan truck and taken out into the Malala Forest, where she was stripped of her clothing, threatened with a knife, tied up, and her feet were ferociously bitten. Now, fortunately, during this crime, uh, this semi-truck driver starts coming up this access road that leads into the Malala Forest, where Dayton and this woman are. And they both notice him and Dayton panics and starts to take off down the forest, uh, the ac forest access road towards this semi-truck, but that's the only way he can get out. And this girl had the presence of mind and the bravery to bail out of the truck. And she made a beeline right to the semi-truck. He did pick her up and take her down to the police station where she filed a report giving a lot of detail about what, about what had happened to her. Now, that was not the only case that John read through the day before. Uh, there were, were several other reports of women talking about this guy named Steve, how he'd taken these women out to remote areas and had done horribly awful, violent sexual things to them. And also there were reports of several missing sex workers. So when John Turner gets down to the Denny's parking lot and begins investigating, all of this stuff is kind of circulating in his mind. And he's starting to think, I, I wonder if this, the same person is committing all of these crimes. So, you know, they cordon off the area. They start taking pictures of all the evidence. Uh, Jenny does have one remaining shoe that they find in the parking lot. Uh, her shoelaces, there's empty vodka bottles, empty orange juice container, and they also find the knife that he had pulled out of the glove box, the Regency Sheffield knife that he had thrown in the bushes. So the gentleman that had written down uh, Dayton Rogers' uh, license plate turns that over to John Turner, and he finds out very quickly that the truck belongs to Dayton Rogers, gets his address, and he and another detective race over there. It's about five o'clock in the morning now, like, you know, it's taken a few hours for all of this to transpire. 
uh, when they go up to Dayton Rogers' house and knock on the door, of course, Sherry answers the door and she has absolutely no idea why they're there. She's very bewildered. She has no idea what they want with Dayton. Uh, and she basically just says like, you know, he was here last night, but he went down to his shop to uh, continue on working on some work that he'd fallen behind on. And that's, you know, pretty common for him. That's what he does most, most often. And the detectives are like, huh, okay. So they end up going down to Dayton's shop. And as they're walking up to the door, John Turner takes his hand and puts it on the hood of the Nissan truck and it's warm. So they're like, okay, obviously he was driving not very long ago. So Dayton lets them into the shop and John Turner and this other detective noticed, uh, notice a few things right away. Number one, Dayton had just recently showered, like his hair was wet. Uh, they also noticed that he has, one of his hands had a pretty large bandage wrapped around it. Uh, they also did see a few droplets of blood that led into the bathroom in Dayton's shop. And they also noticed that Dayton reeked of alcohol and that there was a uh, handheld hacksaw that was laying on his workbench that appeared to have some blood and possibly some tissue on it. Not only that, but his shop was absolutely spotless, absolutely meticulous. And John is thinking, you know, if this guy's here working uh, on a greasy engine, why is it so clean in here? So that really kind of alerted them that something wasn't right here. As they start questioning Dayton, at first Dayton is kind of just going along with things, being very friendly, very cordial, very cooperative. Uh, but they notice that very quickly his story keeps changing. It changes like four or five times. Uh, first he says, oh yeah, I was here all night working on an engine. Then he says, well, actually I, I got here and I was so tired that I fell asleep. Then he says, well, actually I came down here to get away from my wife and to drink. I have a drinking problem. Then he says, well, yeah, my, my car's warm because uh, I, I did need to go get some more alcohol. I mean, just the story kept changing and changing and changing. And the more that they were questioning him, the more surly he was getting and, and more uncooperative that he was getting. Now, to make a long story short, kind of too late here, uh, they end up arresting him and taking him down to the Clackamas County Jail. Now, at this point, John Turner has a search warrant issued on Dayton's home, his shop, and his truck. And they find some things pretty quickly in, as they're investigating. Uh, they notice that there is a, a wood stove that's in the shop, Dayton's shop, and they start digging through the ashes and they find bra hooks. Uh, they find jewelry remnants like earrings and necklaces. They find uh, belt buckles and they also find some silver details that match completely with the silver details that are on Jenny Smith's shoe that they find in the parking lot. So, you know, everything's starting to kind of tie together. And John then starts to really investigate all of these reports that were laying on his desk. He starts going and meeting with family members of the women that were reported missing. Uh, he starts meeting with other women that had detailed uh, having run-ins with this Steve guy in the light blue Nissan truck that matches Dayton's truck completely and just starts piecing things together. And he starts to really realize that this is a lot larger than what they even realize it is. And all of this kind of comes to a head finally on August 31st of 1987. 46-year-old Everett Banyard uh, is going to go enjoy the eighth day of hunting season here in Oregon. So he hops in his truck and takes off to the Malala Forest. And he knows of a perfect place that he frequently goes to go hunting. He pulls into this nice clearing. It's kind of like a Y in the road and there's this nice clearing. And uh, he gets out and he's starting to head along a very familiar path because, like I said, he's been hunting here several times. And as he's walking down this path uh, in, amongst the trees and the ferns and the undergrowth, he is smacked in the face by this overwhelming smell of decomposing flesh. And initially he thinks, well, it's probably a poacher. You know, that happens often where they'll you know kill a deer and then haul it off and leave it. So he thinks, well, I'm going to go investigate. So he starts walking into this undergrowth area and comes upon a naked female corpse. And he notices right away that one of her feet is missing. And he just panics and he runs back to his vehicle. He races back into town, calls the police, reports this. So the police follow Everett back out to uh, the area in Malala Forest where he found this corpse and start investigating. And they're pretty sure just based on what they see that this woman is a sex worker, was a sex worker, based on some tattoos they see on her body, uh, her jewelry, just kind of the state that she's in. And uh, of course they notice that one of her feet is missing and they start doing like this whole big grid pattern search of the area. And they have all these, like the cavalry comes, all these officers come, medical examiner, the whole nine yards. 
And as they start doing this very intricate search, they come upon six more corpses, six more naked female dead bodies in varying stages of decomposition. And again, they're pretty convinced that they're all sex workers. And so the medical examiner starts investigating each corpse as they come upon them. Uh, the second body that they found was actually missing both of her feet. Uh, they ended up finding her feet underneath of her body. Uh, and at first they were thinking, well, maybe an animal got to them, but it was obvious that the uh, feet were removed at the ankle by what looked like possibly a hacksaw. Now remember, they did find the hacksaw on Dayton's workbench that looked like it had blood and tissue on it. The medical examiner determined that all of the bodies uh, died from very significant stab wounds, primarily to their lower back. Uh, also, a couple of the bodies had uh, severe knife injuries. Uh, they were cut from their necks all the way down to their pelvis. And also because the corpses were in varying stages of decomposition, the medical examiner determined that this had been going on for quite some time. And honestly, they were kind of surprised that they only found the seven bodies. I mean, they, they were pretty sure that they were probably going to continue to find more. And who knows, there could be more. I mean, one of the corpses they found was almost skeletonized. So, I mean, it's very likely that there were more bodies that they just did not discover that maybe, you know, he uh, were hidden better or maybe animals got to, they weren't sure. So John Turner gets called to come out to the Malala Forest crime scene. And he is just like, no way. He just cannot believe this. I mean, he had some suspicions that this was bigger than what it was initially, but he was not prepared for this. And as he started to look through the bags and bags of evidence that they had gathered, his blood just ran cold because he started seeing these miniature travel size uh, Smirnoff vodka bottles, the empty orange juice bottles. They ended up finding a knife uh, that was used in the murders of these uh, victims that was the same exact knife matched totally with the Regency Sheffield knife that Dayton had used to stab Jenny Smith to death. It came from the same kitchen knife set from the Rogers household. So John is like, okay, what I gotta do here is I gotta make sure that this sticks with this guy. Because of course he had looked into Dayton Rogers' background, his criminal background, and he had seen all the, the numerous times that Dayton was just let go or didn't serve hardly any time or didn't serve the full length of time that he should have. And John's like, there's no way this is gonna happen on my watch. So what he decides to do uh, initially is he's like, I got to find this woman who uh, escaped him, that jumped out of the truck, got in with the semi truck driver and have her identify Dayton Rogers. And it took him a while, but they were finally able to find her. And she immediately identified Dayton Rogers from a series of mugshots. Just boom, that's him. Uh, they were also able to find the semi truck driver and he also identified uh, Dayton Rogers. It wasn't like a 100% identification of Dayton Rogers because he only kind of like got a glimpse of him as they were passing each other. But he was pretty sure that that was Dayton Rogers. So who are the victims? I'm going to pop up some pictures of the victims and uh, give you their names and their ages and just spend some time talking about these women. Jennifer Lisa Smith, age 26. Lisa Marie Mock, age 23. Maureen Ann Hodges, age 26. Christine Lotus Adams, age 35. Cynthia DeVore, age 20. Nandis Cervantes, age 26. Retha Giles, age 16. Tanya Jury Johnson, age 18. Now, uh, Dayton Rogers was never convicted of Tanya's death uh, because she was unidentified at the time that her body was found. And actually she wasn't identified positively until 2013 when DNA evidence had become so much uh, better researched. I guess that's the best way I can think of it. Now, all of these women, all of them had been reported missing. Uh, they came from families that loved them very much. Some of them were wives. All of them were daughters. Some of them were mothers. They were all human beings and they all had family and friends that loved them very much and have very deeply mourned the loss of these women. And thank goodness for John Turner, because if it wasn't for John Turner, I don't really know that anyone would have investigated these missing women as thoroughly as he did and really gone for it with the investigation uh, 
into Dayton Rogers crimes. You know, I mean, he really took a personal stake in finding out who all of these women were, going and talking to all of their families. I mean, he put a lot of energy and emotion into figuring out who the victims were. And I was just very moved and very touched by that because so often you'll hear about sex workers who are murdered and they either never identify the woman, they never find the killer. It's just like they're just thrown in a drawer somewhere and the cases and then that's it. So luckily all of these women, I mean, it took a while for Tanya Johnson to be identified, but luckily all of them were identified and all of the families were given some closure. Now, what happened to Dayton? Well, ultimately in 1988, uh, Dayton was convicted of first degree murder of Jenny Smith and was sentenced to life in prison with parole. And in June of 1989, Dayton Rogers was sentenced to death for the Malala Forest killings. All but one, uh, because they weren't able to identify Tanya Johnson until 2013, that was not included in his sentence which I, I don't really understand why when they identified her, I mean, I don't know why it matters if someone's identified or not. I mean, someone should still be convicted of their murder. I mean, he killed her. Uh, but for whatever reason, they just never included that in his sentence and they've never gone back and added it onto his sentence. Now, the really interesting thing here is that in 1992, again, in the year 2000, 2012 and 2015, Dayton utilized the appeal process and his death sentence was overturned by the Oregon Supreme Court on all four of those occasions. And also on all four of those occasions, when it went to uh, possibly a new trial, the juries in each time said, no, we want to impose the death penalty on this man. And so every time he appealed, the Oregon Supreme Court would overturn it. The jury would say, nope, and put it right back to the death penalty. However, in 2022, former Oregon Governor Kate Brown, she commuted all of the death sentence. So everybody that was on death row got their sentence commuted to life in prison. So he is currently serving the rest of his life sentence out at the Oregon State Penitentiary. And John Turner, that amazing man that he was, he passed away at age 73 in 2016 after a long battle with cancer. And he is thoroughly missed by his very large family and also by his police family as well. Uh, he was just a stellar uh, police detective. And like I said earlier, he really put in a lot of emotion and love into his job and really did his very best to investigate every crime that he was ever asked to investigate. And I know that his presence is very missed at the Clackamas County Sheriff's Department. Now, of course, like I do with all of my videos, I'm gonna give you my two cents. And this might take me a minute here because I have a few things I want to say. Now, obviously, I read the book. Very hard to read. <laughs> I will say that. And I understand that Dayton came from a very horribly abusive background, childhood. I mean, I get that. And I understand that the abuse that he suffered, I'm, I'm sure, contributed to his psychological problems, uh, the violent sexual fantasies he had, and also acting out these extremely violent sexual fantasies. I get that. But I do want to say something. I know a lot of people, well, maybe not, not a lot, but a good handful of people that have come from extremely abusive backgrounds, extremely abusive. Like one of my really close friends uh, has come from, I mean, you, you would not believe the abuse that she endured growing up. And none of the people that I know have behaved the way that Dayton Rogers has, okay? So I, I do think there's obviously something more to it than just his childhood. And I also believe that if the justice system had been proactive rather than reactive and had gotten on this much sooner, I, I do think those women would still be alive. Uh, he was just kind of like slapped on the wrist and then just kicked on out of there. I mean, he, he should have been under supervision when he was released from prison. Number one, he should have served all 10 years and he should have been on some kind of uh, law enforcement supervision for the rest of his life. I mean, absolutely. And I truly believe, and this might be controversial, but I'm, I'm going to say this. I truly believe that men who commit uh, violent sexual crimes, I don't know that that's curable. I, I, I really don't know that it is. And I, I do believe that when men start to show a propensity of violence, sexual violence towards women, it's got to be handled and handled properly. You don't just kick them out onto the street because they serve their time. I, I just, that's really hard for me to, to accept and to wrap my head around and to agree with. I, I never will. 
So I do believe that if the justice system had done their job and really come down on him hard, uh, and, and also not just come down on him hard, but also had some proper psychological treatment for him. I do think that's a huge component of this too. Didn't just take him at his word when he was in the Oregon State Hospital, like really delved into what was going on with him and really did their best to really treat him, not just say, okay, you're cured. I mean, he was only in the hospital for like, I don't know, six or seven months. I mean, come on, you know, it just seems very unfair. And you know, my heart really goes out to his wife, goes out to his child. I mean, you know, I was thinking a lot about what it must have been like to be his wife and to find out that he'd done all these things. And, uh, you know, I, I, I do think, I mean, John Turner did interview her and her father-in-law and they both did say that, yeah, there were things that he would do that were unsettling, that were disturbing, that they didn't like. But I think, they just wanted so desperately for them to be a happy family that they were just in complete and total denial. And that, that's really sad. But I, I mean, really, I have a lot of uh, empathy for her, like sympathy for her. I feel really bad for her. How horrible. And now I do want to touch on the victims here. Uh, I know I already kind of talked about this, but I'm going to talk about it a little bit more in depth here. I understand that when sex workers are murdered or the victims of violent crimes, that a, a lot of people will have this attitude of, well, you chose that line of work. Like you're putting yourself in the line of fire. You're putting yourself in danger. And I absolutely categorically disagree with that. Nobody deserves to be the victim of a violent crime and nobody deserves to be murdered. You don't have to agree with the way someone lives their life. That's fine. You don't have to agree with that. But to say that anyone deserves that kind of treatment and that kind of end to their life is absolutely not okay with me. Not okay at all. And I, as I was reading the book, I mean, there were so many times I was like, go, John, go, John, go, because he was so involved in that investigation and really, like I said, took it personally and was like, I am going to find out as much as I can about these victims, their families, so that this isn't just another case to me. Like, I really do want to have a personal uh, involvement in this case. And I just thought that was awesome. Absolutely awesome. And my heart goes out to those families of all of those victims and uh, also really goes out to the family of Tanya Johnson, who wasn't identified until 2013. I mean, for all these years, they had no idea what had happened to her. Just awful. And, um, you know, I, I just, I ask that if, I just ask that you have a, a tender attitude about the victims here. I really do. And, you know, like I said, whether you agree with their lifestyle or not, they are still human beings. And like I said, they did not deserve to come to this horribly awful, violent end of their lives. Absolutely not. And most of these women were very young. I mean, just starting out in their lives, you know? I mean, it's just, it's heartbreaking to me. So this was the case of Dayton Leroy Rogers, also known as the Malala Forest Killer. I would love to chat with you guys about this case in the comment section if you're aware of this case, or uh, maybe if you plan on picking up the book to find out more about this case. Um, normally I will go and find a couple documentaries about the case and watch those, but for whatever reason, I just didn't do that this time, but I'll, I'll see, maybe, maybe I'll see if I can find a couple and link them in my description box. Uh, the next case will be coming or the next video will be coming in August, probably late August. And I'm not exactly sure what case I'm going to do yet, but I have a pretty good idea. I have like three or four books now to choose from to read, to give you guys another video. And I, I guess I'm looking forward to it. These are just really hard to film, but I, I really do appreciate you guys taking time out of your lives to sit down and watch and listen to these videos because I, I know they're really not easy to get, get through, but um, I really, really hope you know I do really appreciate your time, and I really hope you guys take very good care of yourselves. Please stay safe, and I will see you in the next video.